This week on our look through the various features of Entity Framework Core, we're going to be looking at the ideas of eager loading and lazy loading. And it's something we have to tackle quite early on because in Entity Framework Core, you just cannot really get any kind of advanced application to work without dealing with these issues. In Entity Framework 6, as we saw last time, it kind of hides this away from you, which makes life easier, but can tempt us to write very inefficient code. So instead, we're going to have to deal with it straight up and let's have a look at the ideas behind that now. So what I've done, I've still got the book library, which we generated a few weeks ago. So we've got our books context with DB sets of authors and books. And we generated that, in fact, as an SQLite database. What I've added here is actually a .NET Core website. And the reason I've done that is partly it's just a bit more interesting in the console application, but also it makes the logging really easy. And I wanted to have logging turned on so that we can see precisely the SQL, the Density Framework, is issuing to the database. So at the moment, I've just got a books controller. And in my books controller, I have got this index that just gets hold of the books from our context and then does a to list to generate them, and that goes into the view. And if we run that up, then it runs up the console for our web server, and then runs up the browser, and then we can see our list of books from the data we had last time in our database. And if we go back and look at the console, there you can see, this is why I wanted to do it like this, it is showing us the query that it sent basically to get the ID, the author ID, the title, and the year of publication from our books table. So although I didn't have to write that, that was being generated in the code when we did this to list async on there. Just to point out a detail of that, in order to get that displayed, I had to go to my app settings development.json and just set that one to the information level, just to make sure it's logging all of my SQL queries. And that can be very useful if you want to do any analysis of the SQL being generated by Entity Framework. But there's a couple of things to notice there. One is if we look at the actual browser, we can see that it's missed off the author entirely. It's just put a blank there. And actually, that's a really nasty thing to do. In some situations, it would have actually thrown an exception because it couldn't find the authors, which at least would have told us up front there was a problem. Whereas here, it's failing quietly. But you're probably able to guess that the reason it's failing is exactly the same problem we saw previously, that I didn't do anything in terms of eager loading. Or so although I pulled in the books, it didn't pull in the authors for those books. And we can see that again by looking at the SQL, it's just pulled in the books. So let's fix that. The easy way to fix that, as we've already seen, is eager loading, pop in and include. So if I just say here dot include and then b gives b dot author and then run that up again. Then we see a couple of things. The important thing is we've now got the authors listed in there. And if we look at the SQL, you can see a rather more complicated query because it's done a join between the books table and the authors table. As you'd expect, it would need to get that information out of there. We didn't have to write that for ourselves. We write code in an object-oriented style of way where you just have a reference from a book to the author. So if we look at the view where that's actually happening, essentially it was there. So when I just say item.author.name, but it's already previously, because of the include, generated that join in the SQL. So that's what we have in the, the simplest configuration of Entity Framework Core, that if we don't do anything, it will fail in some way. It won't pull in the author. Or we can do the eager loading with the include, which is probably the best way to go. But we saw last week when I was doing this sort of thing with Entity Framework 6, that it just automatically had this alternative idea of lazy load. Well, lazy loading isn't a great idea, but it is available in EF Core, but we've got to add it as an option. So if we go to our library and go to NuGet and do a search for Entity Framework Core dot proxies, then we can see there is the additional package we need to load. So let's install that. 
And then we've got to configure it for use, which we do in our application startup. So if we go to the startup in there and where we've got this configured to use SQLite, just before that actually, we say dot use lazy loading proxies. So having installed the package, we then use the package. And if we then go back to our controller and remove the eager loading, then we've also got to do one other thing. What we've got to do is go to the entities and on any one of the properties that is what we call a navigation property that takes us across a join, basically, these have to be declared as virtual. So our author's collection of books has to be virtual, and indeed our book's reference to an author has to be virtual. And you may have noticed when we looked at the code generation from the DB, it actually did that for us. If we look at books there, this is the generated code, you can see it put that virtual in, really in anticipation that we might want to use lazy loading. But if you're not using lazy loading, you don't need to put those virtuals in, and it would be a bit of an overhead if you did, because there is a very slight cost of virtual lookup. Not a huge amount, but why put them in if you're not going to use them? So having done that, having made those virtual in our book library, now if we run this up, we can see it's still working. So even though we didn't do the eagle load, even though we didn't explicitly say we needed the authors as well as the books, it kind of worked that out. But we can also see what the big problem is. If we look at the generated SQL, you can see it's issued three separate queries. So there we've got a query to get the books, and then we've got a query to get one of the authors, either in Fleming or Jane Austen, can't really tell which, and then to get the other author. So it's not as bad as it might be. It didn't do six requests for authors for each of the six books. It managed to work out once it had loaded Jane Austen, once it didn't need to do it again, but it is still doing it in a less efficient way. And you can imagine if we had lots of books and thousands of different authors, then it would be a difference between one single query with a join or possibly thousands of independent queries. And that is almost always going to be inefficient, maybe extremely inefficient. I've known differences with this of factor of 100 or more in terms of the performance of getting the data out of the database. And that is why lazy loading is so frowned upon, why it's no longer the default behavior, why you've got to put this effort into making it. Worth looking a little bit at the actual mechanism by that works. We've had a couple of clues to that. One is the name of that package, talking about proxies, because actually what we've got here is a usage of a gang of four design pattern, a thing called a proxy pattern, where one object that looks exactly like the object you think you're dealing with stands in as a proxy for it. And that's what's happening here. Let's just go back and turn off the lazy loading. All we have to do is just comment that out and then put a break in our books controller. Let's just change the code here so we can really see what's going on. So let's say var books equals and then grab all of that. And then maybe just do var b equals books dot first. Just so we've got hold of one of those books. And actually now we've done that, let's just pass books straight in there rather than querying it twice. But if I put a break in there and run up to that point, and if we look at that variable b in the debugger, we can see that it's of type book library dot book, exactly what we'd expect. That was the class which we wrote. However, if I were to put the lazy loading back in there and do the same sort of thing, now we can see that the actual type is castle.proxies.bookproxy. So what it's done is for each one of the entity types, so you can see it's done for author as well, it has generated on the fly a proxy class. So a proxy class that looks like it and is in fact derived from it. That's how it can be assigned into 
the static type of booklibrary.book, but which has overridden those virtual properties. So that's why I had to make the collection and the author virtual so that it could override them and put in the necessary code to do the lazy loading to pick the things up that we needed. So that's how it's actually doing it. And that's why we've got to add these proxies and make those methods virtual. If we didn't make them virtual, it wouldn't be able to override them and it wouldn't behave in the correct way. And again, that's another overhead. It's not a huge one, but it means it's more complicated than just having the simple classes we wrote for ourselves, which require us to use eager loading. If you have lazy loading enabled, it doesn't mean you have to use it. So I could still, in this case, put my include of author. And that would be a pretty sensible thing to do, because although it won't avoid the overhead of having these proxies and having these virtual methods, it does at least mean that we anticipate the behavior of the lazy loading, and it's gone back to just doing that single query that we can see in there. But better still, I would say always turn lazy loading off. The only circumstance I've actually seen a genuine benefit to lazy loading, rather than just making our life a bit easier for programmers, is sometimes if you do a huge amount of eager loading where you've got lots of tables and therefore lots of joins involved, the actual query can become so complicated that the execution time of the query becomes longer than the time you'd have wasted by, by issuing multiple queries. So occasionally it can be something, and you can only find out by experiment, something you want to go for. But even then, it's better not to use lazy loading, because the problem with lazy loading is you don't know when it's happening. If you don't want to eager load, if you do want to load later on, but you want control of it, we use what's known as explicit loading. So that's the other thing I can do. So let's again turn off lazy loading, just so we know it's not happening. And then what we'll do here is, having got hold of our books, so remember at this stage, with the lazy loading turned off, it's not going to load up the authors. But what I could do would be this. I could say, for each var b in books, and then I could say, underscore context, dot entry and then pass in really any entity object. So I could pass in an author or a book or anything like that. And this entry gives us back a wrapper around the actual book that allows us to do more detailed things to it that essentially mean that we're aware of the fact it's actually connected to the database rather than just being a book. And so we can see we've got things like the current values, we've got the original values. So if we change it, we can look at these things. And so sometimes if you really want to get down into the nitty gritty of what's happening in Entity Framework, wrapping the actual entity up in this entry is quite a nice way to go. But the thing we wanted to do here was this explicit loading. So what I'm going to do here is say reference and then book gives book dot author and then I say dot load. And in some ways that looks a bit like eager loading, particularly that bit there. And conceptually it's doing the same thing. Let's get rid of our eager loading though but it's doing it later on. It's not forcing the original query to be a join. It's simply saying, at this point, you're going to have to do another query. So it achieves the same thing as lazy loading, but it does it explicitly under our control, which is why it's called explicit loading. Just to um, show you one slight difference there, remember a book has a single author, so there we used reference. If we'd been going the other way, where an author has several books, we would do collection rather than reference. So slight difference to watch out for there, but they both achieve the same thing. And so now, even though we don't have lazy loading enabled, we haven't done the eager loading, when we run that up, it works. But if we look at the SQL, we can see it's still having to generate the three queries, 
one for the books and then one for each of the authors. So it's just as inefficient as lazy loading. So there we have it. Best thing to do is forget about lazy loading entirely. It's extra work you have to do and it can really slow down your application without you really noticing what's going on because it all happens under the covers. Much better just to use eager loading to work out how many joins you're going to need, express that up front, and it will generate a very optimal query with those joins in there. And then finally, just occasionally, if that is getting over complicated, you might want to do explicit loading. But the benefit of explicit loading over lazy loading is you know what's going on. You have explicitly stated it. It's not just going to happen without you understanding how the programs work. So that's getting into some more detail of Entity Framework Core. Lots more to cover in subsequent videos. So do subscribe and don't miss out.